The topic of this lecture is enzyme mechanisms. This material gets at the heart of enzyme catalysis. We'll take a detailed look at the chemical processes that an enzyme uses to affect catalysis. On an exam question asking how an enzyme can carry out catalysis, the typical answer is that enzymes form an ES complex and provide an alternate reaction pathway with a lower energy of activation. That answer is only partially correct, and it doesn't really get to the heart of the question. So if you give me that answer on an exam, you'll only get partial, low partial credit. The real answer is that there are a number of chemical mechanisms that an enzyme provides which collectively result in significant catalysis. We'll look at those mechanisms in this lecture. Here's a list of the most significant ways in which enzymes carry out catalysis. The mechanisms include proximity and orientation effects, general acid and general base catalysis, electrostatic effects, nucleophilic and electrophilic catalysis, structural flexibility, entropy loss, desolvation, and covalent catalysis. Enzymes bind substrates in close proximity to each other and in the correct orientation so that reaction may occur without the need for a random collision between reactants. This reduces the entropy of the reactants making ligation or addition reactions more favorable and it reduces the overall loss of entropy when two reactants become a single product. This concentration of the substrates in the active site simulates the effect of increased substrate concentrations and gives the reactions a pseudo intramolecular character. The chemical example of succinic anhydride formation shows how having two reacting groups in proximity to each other can facilitate reaction. Instead of waiting for a random collision to bring two carboxylic acid groups together, the proximity of the two carboxylate groups in succinate facilitates their reaction. This figure shows the rate enhancements for proximity effects during the formation of carboxylic anhydrides in a chemical reaction using constrained substrates. By placing the reacting groups in the correct proximity and orientation, the chemical reaction can be enhanced by a factor of 10 to the eighth. An enzyme can act as a proton donor, an acid, or a proton acceptor, a base, to promote rapid reaction. In fact, the same enzyme can simultaneously function as both an acid and a base. The substitution of enzyme functional groups for hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions permits rapid enzyme catalysis at neutral pH. Acid-base catalysis often involves the histidine imidazole group because it has an appropriate pK which allows it to act as either an acid or a base at neutral pH. Panel A shows the chemical hydrolysis of an ester at neutral pH. This reaction is slow for a number of reasons. It depends on the availability of a hydroxyl ion, which at pH 7 is present at 10 to the minus 7th molar. It involves an anionic transition state with a minus charge on an oxygen atom. Formation of this anionic intermediate involves a very high energy of activation. Furthermore, it uses water as a source of a proton for the cleavage of an OR group. This is much slower than the direct reaction with a free proton. Panel B shows the same reaction in the presence of a base, B-. The reaction is facilitated because the base strips a proton from water and thus provides a hydroxyl ion much faster. However, because the hydroxyl ion is higher in a base solution, the hydrogen ion proton concentration will be lower, so the reaction components that require acid catalysis will be slowed down. Panel C shows the same reaction in the presence of an acid, HA. The acid might help stabilize the anionic transition state by neutralizing the minus charge on the oxygen atom. It might also provide a proton for the cleavage of the OR group. However, because the hydrogen ion is higher in an acid solution, the hydroxyl ion concentration will be lower, 
so reaction components that require base catalysis will be slowed. The genius of enzyme catalysis is that an enzyme can provide both high acid and high base equivalents at neutral pH. The enzyme provides both hydroxyl ions and hydrogen ions at the exact place that they are needed to facilitate catalysis. The simultaneous availability of both components results in a marked enhancement in the rate of ester hydrolysis. Covalent catalysis involves the substrate forming a transient covalent bond with the amino acid R group in the active site of an enzyme. The formation of a covalent intermediate can substitute for the nucleophilic attack by a hydroxyl group and can also reduce the energy of later transition states of the reaction. The covalent bond must at a later stage in the reaction be broken to regenerate the enzyme. This type of covalent catalysis mechanism is found in proteolytic enzymes such as chymotrypsin and trypsin where an acyl enzyme intermediate is formed. In hydrolysis reactions, there's often a nucleophilic attack of a free hydroxyl group on a carbonyl carbon. In certain serine proteases such as chymotrypsin, an active site serine hydroxyl group substitutes for a free hydroxyl group resulting in a covalent enzyme substrate acyl enzyme ester intermediate. Since the serine hydroxyl is always present at exactly the right place in the active site of the enzyme, the rate of reaction is increased. The formation of a positively charged covalent intermediate called a shift's base between enzyme and substrate promotes the movement of electrons that's needed for the decarboxylation of acetoacetate. That is, the enzyme provides an alternate transition state in which there's no minus charge on an anionic oxygen atom. This alternate pathway of reaction results in a lower energy of activation. Some enzymes use non-protein cofactors such as pyridoxal phosphate or thiamine pyrophosphate to form covalent intermediates with reactant molecules. Such covalent intermediates function to reduce the energy of the reaction transition state. This is similar to the use of covalent intermediates with active site amino acid residues. The ability of cofactors to delocalize electrons allows enzymes to carry out reactions that amino acid side chain residues alone could not accomplish. Enzymes utilizing covalent intermediates with cofactors include the pyridoxal phosphate dependent enzyme aspartate transaminase and the thiamine pyrophosphate dependent enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase. This reaction mechanism involving pyridoxal phosphate occurs during the transamination of amino acids. In this mechanism, a covalent intermediate is formed between the amino acid substrate and the pyridoxal cofactor. The association with the pyridoxal cofactor provides an alternate transition state intermediate in place of an anionic species that would form in the uncatalyzed reaction. Binding to the enzyme reduces random tumbling and stretching of the substrate. This is a low entropy state that favors reaction of the ES complex. Substrates often have water tightly bound to their surface. Binding to the enzyme can release this water and make the substrate more reactive. If repulsive charges occur between substrate and enzyme, and these repulsive forces can be relieved during reaction, the reaction rate may be speeded. Enzymes generally bind their substrates fairly tightly, and it's sometimes suggested that this plays a major role in lowering the energy of activation of an enzymatic reaction. However, the occurrence of a very tight binding association between substrate and enzyme would actually place the ES complex in an energy well, and this would make the energy of activation higher than for the uncatalyzed reaction. The current working hypothesis for enzymatic catalysis is that the tightest binding may actually occur between enzyme and transition state intermediates. 
This would effectively lower the energy of activation and speed the reaction rate. This figure shows the reaction pathway for a catalyzed and an uncatalyzed reaction. The uncatalyzed reaction has a relatively high energy level for the transition state. The catalyzed reaction has a slightly lowered energy level for the ES complex and a relatively low energy level for the transition state. The important feature here is that the overall energy of activation is much lower for the catalyzed reaction. This would not be possible if the ES complex was at an extremely low energy level. We will now study the enzyme chymotrypsin, which uses some of the catalytic functions we've just discussed. Chymotrypsin is a digestive enzyme that catalyzes proteolysis of peptide bonds. The enzyme preferentially cleaves peptide bonds on the carboxyl side of tyrosine, tryptophan, and phenylalanine. These amino acids contain aromatic rings in their side chains. During catalysis, these aromatic rings fit into a hydrophobic pocket of the enzyme. Chymotrypsin cleaves peptide bonds by attacking the peptide carbonyl group with a powerful nucleophile, the serine 195 residue, located in the active site of the enzyme. The active site serine residue briefly becomes covalently bonded to the substrate, forming an enzyme substrate intermediate. This figure shows the mechanism of peptide bond cleavage. This is a hydrolytic reaction which uses the elements of water to break a peptide bond and form a carboxyl group and an amino group. The reaction equilibrium is highly in favor of peptide bond cleavage. This peptide contains the amino acid phenylalanine. Chymotrypsin would cleave this peptide to the right of the phenylalanine residue. It would cleave the bond shown in red between the carbonyl group of phenylalanine and the amino group of asparagine. Chymotrypsin is a serine protease. Its active site has a uniquely active serine hydroxyl group, serine 195, that can lose a proton and become anionic during the course of catalysis. That property makes the active site serine residue highly susceptible to reaction with the reagent DIFP. This reaction produces a covalent product and inactivates the enzyme. This figure gives a generalized scheme for the enzymatic hydrolysis of amides or esters in reactions involving active site serine residues. There's an acylation phase in which the alcohol or amine is released and the active site serine is acylated. That's followed by a deacylation phase in which the carboxylic acid component is released from the enzyme. The intermediate in this process is an acyl enzyme intermediate in which the carboxylic acid portion of the substrate is covalently bound to the surface of the enzyme. The active site of chymotrypsin contains a catalytic triad consisting of the amino acids histidine 57, aspartate 102, and serine 195. These three amino acids are especially important in catalysis. Hydrogen ions are passed back and forth between these three amino acids. That sharing of protons has the net effect of stabilizing the serine hydroxyl group in the negative anionic state. Note that these active site amino acids come from residues that are spatially separated in the primary sequence of the enzyme. This figure shows the overall mechanism of the reaction catalyzed by chymotrypsin. Hydrolysis of an amide substrate involves the participation of the catalytic triad, the formation of a covalent acyl enzyme intermediate, and the transient existence of various tetrahedral transition state intermediates. In step one of the reaction, there's a nucleophilic attack by the active site serine on the carbonyl group of the amide substrate. In step two, the first tetrahedral intermediate is formed. This intermediate is unstable because of its anionic character, that is, the negative charge on the oxygen. That anionic intermediate is stabilized by charge groups 
in the anionic hole in the enzyme's active site. This stabilization lowers the energy of activation and speeds the rate of reaction. The enzyme is providing an alternate reaction mechanism that has a reduced energy of activation. In step 3, the tetrahedral intermediate breaks down, cleaving the amine product from the rest of the substrate. The portion of the molecule that remains covalently bound to the active site serine corresponds to the carboxylic acid part of the substrate. This is the acyl enzyme intermediate, which is much more stable than the anionic intermediates. Under certain conditions, serine proteases can be isolated with the acyl enzyme intermediate covalently attached to the enzyme's active site serine. In step 4, the amine product picks up a proton from the active site histidine and it diffuses away. In this reaction, the histidine is acting as an acid or proton donor. In step 5, there's a nucleophilic attack of a hydroxyl ion on the acyl enzyme intermediate. The production of the hydroxyl ion from water in the active site is promoted by the active site histidine, which acts as a base or proton acceptor, to remove the proton from the water molecule. In step 6, a second tetrahedral intermediate is formed. Similar to the chemistry of step 2, this intermediate is unstable because of its anionic character or the negative charge on the oxygen. That anionic intermediate is again stabilized by charge groups in the anionic hole in the enzyme's active site. This is a second transition state intermediate whose energy of activation is reduced by interaction with the active site of the enzyme. In step 7, the second tetrahedral intermediate is attacked by a proton conveniently provided by the active site histidine residue. The anionic oxygen is converted to a carbonyl group and the attachment of the intermediate to the active site serine is broken. In step 8, the carboxylate product diffuses away and the enzyme reverts to its original state. The oxyanion hole is the place in the active site of chymotrypsin where a negatively charged oxyanion forms on the substrate. This oxyanion is a highly unstable intermediate in the mechanism of chymotrypsin and it has a very high energy level. The figure shows how the tetrahedral anionic intermediate is stabilized by hydrogen bonding to two protons from peptide amino groups on the enzyme. This stabilization of the intermediate lowers the energy of the transition state. There are many serine proteases which are homologs of chymotrypsin, including some of the enzymes involved in the blood clotting cascade. These enzymes have evolved from common evolutionary precursor proteins. These homologous proteases exhibit similarities in amino acid sequence and have the same catalytic triad and oxyanion hole that's found in chymotrypsin. There are other serine proteases which are not homologs of chymotrypsin, that is, they have very different sequences and have evolved independently. The next two slides illustrate a catalytic triad and an oxyanion hole in the proteases subtle lysin and carboxypeptidase 2. These enzymes are not homologs of chymotrypsin or of each other. This figure illustrates the occurrence of a catalytic triad and an oxyanion hole in the protease subtle lysin. This enzyme is not a homologue of chymotrypsin. Thus the occurrence of these features in subtle lysin represents an interesting example of convergent evolution. This figure shows that the same pattern of a catalytic triad and an oxyanion hole has also been observed in carboxypeptidase 2. This enzyme is not significantly similar to either chymotrypsin or subtle lysin. This figure shows the structure of an important protease inhibitor, indenivir, which is used in the treatment of AIDS. Indenivir inhibits the HIV protease produced by the AIDS virus. Indenivir resembles the peptide substrate for the HIV protease. 
We'll now turn our attention to a different enzyme, carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic anhydrase plays an important role in the removal of carbon dioxide from the human body. In red blood cells, the enzyme catalyzes the conversion of carbon dioxide to carbonic acid. This reaction proceeds at a moderate pace even in the absence of any enzyme, but the presence of carbonic anhydrase makes it an extremely fast reaction. Carbonic anhydrase catalyzes the condensation of carbon dioxide with water to form carbonic acid. The carbonic acid then dissociates to form bicarbonate ion plus a proton. Carbonic anhydrase contains a zinc ion that is essential for catalytic activity. That zinc ion is bound to the imidazole rings of three histidine residues. Carbonic anhydrase exhibits a pH optimum at about pH 8. The pH response for this enzyme is thought to reflect the interaction of the zinc ion with a water molecule in the active site. Interaction of water with the enzyme zinc ion lowers the pK of the water from 15.7 to about 7.0. This results in the rapid production of a hydroxyl ion. The hydroxyl ion formed on the carbonic anhydrase zinc ion can act as a nucleophile. The hydroxyl group attacks carbon dioxide and converts it into a bicarbonate ion. This photo of a kayaker was taken on Lake Crescent, which lies in the Olympic National Park. It has to be one of the most beautiful lakes in America. It's very deep and pristine, surrounded by mountains on every side. The colors of the lake are constantly changing depending on the lighting conditions. At times it has this gorgeous green color. The lake is surrounded by rainforest flora, including all kinds of moss and lichens. When Lake Crescent was annexed to become part of the Olympic National Park, there were a number of private cabins on the lake. These cabins were allowed to remain in private hands although no new construction was permitted. Most of the cabins are relatively small and unobtrusive, unlike the mammoth show places that have been built recently on many Minnesota lakes. If you deliberately mess up the focus on your camera, you can make some very impressionistic photos. This kayaker is totally prepared for rainy weather. He's paddling off into the mist. The Spruce Line Trail follows an old logging railroad line along the shore of Lake Crescent. There are all sorts of funky things growing along the trail, including these mushrooms, or shrooms as my grandson likes to call them. Is this Jesus walking on the water, or just my son standing on some rocks? I love the way the white tree trunks are reflected in the green water. Besides moss and lichens, there are nice rocky spots on which succulents find a home. Here is the lake looking blue, which gives a nice contrast to the array of colors reflected from the shoreline. Highway 101 hugs the southern shoreline of the lake, giving travelers on the Olympic Peninsula some dynamite vistas. The road along the shoreline twists and turns. On a rainy day, the view through the windshield is blurred with many colors. You can fish in the lake. However, there are salmon species that are found nowhere else in the world, so they're protected. You may only catch and release in this lake. I hope someone told these boys they can't keep their fish. Although most of the trees near the lake are conifers, some deciduous trees hug the lake shore. They form an interesting network of interlacing branches. I love these colorful reflections. Just can't get enough of the beauty. Sometimes the lake is so calm that it seems like a mirror. The water is nearly black in this particular lighting. 
I wonder how many years old this tree is and how long it's been leaning over the lake. Grab this life preserver and you'd sink right to the bottom of the lake. I wonder who put these posts in the lake and what purpose they could possibly serve. Maybe they had something to do with the logging that occurred 80 to 100 years ago on the shores of the lake.